Good morning, everybody. This is Donna Prosser with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We're here to bring you another COVID-19 update today. And today we, uh, again, are gonna be joined by Dr. Ed Kelly from the World Health Organization. Dr. Kelly is, is pardon me, uh, Dr. Kelly is the Director of Integrated Health Services in, in Geneva, Switzerland with the World Health Organization. He joins us every few weeks to give us an update on what's happening across the world. So thank you, Ed, for joining. My pleasure. So glad to have you again today. Well, it's good to be here and it's always good to, to, uh, to be speaking with the Patient Safety Foundation. We're basically in the midst, as I've said before, of the sort of biggest uh, kind of patient safety uh, event of at least our lifetime. Uh, so who better than the foundation to, to be discussing these things with as we head into the next phase of, the, of this experience. Great, great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, good. Um, well, uh, what I'd like to do is just as usual, um, just to provide a, a few um, sort of framing messages. You don't always have the same folks, at least I hope not, um, for, uh, the, for these webinars. And you know, the, the main point that our Director General and, and WHO has stated in this whole uh, um, experience on uh, COVID from very early on is that the strong health systems uh, have been the way forward to lay the foundation for both uh, global health security, but also for longer term efforts at, uh, on primary health care and universal health coverage. And it's really quite clear that, that at no other time was that more true. Um, and that as we start thinking of what you would say in my current country of uh, residence, France, so le monde après, the, the world after COVID, um, that we really cannot be going back to business as usual. We have to rethink how we're doing things and try to do things better uh, as you know, on the next side. And this applies not just to socioeconomics and the environment, but definitely to healthcare. So I'd like to just outline a few things in terms of the EPI updates and um, uh, some updates from our side on key pieces that we're working on. And I know we have some questions already that have been um, kind of coming in uh, in advance of the discussion. So uh, next slide, please. Um, the, just a quick update here uh, today, 131,296 uh, uh, new cases in the last uh, 24 hours. Um, uh, one thing that we have to be quite clear about um, is that we are not out of the epidemic. We've had some transitions in Europe, definitely not in other parts of the world. And for WHO, as of sort of the 8th of June, there are almost 7 million cases um, uh, reported uh, worldwide, almost 400,000 deaths. Um, and in the last nine out of the last 10 days, we've had over 100,000 cases reported to WHO. And on June 7th, we had 136,000 cases reported in 24 hours, the single biggest day so far. So in contrast to how the, at least the media is covering things, because for very good reasons, there's a lot of other things on people's um, uh, minds right now. Uh, the virus is not only not going away, it's not even going down. Next slide. So this gives you the picture. Um, you can see uh, how things have moved. Uh, there's, there is a definite uh, change in terms of the, um, the epidemiology um, for, uh, in terms of uh, deaths and uh, the sort of what we see in terms of case fatality rate. You see uh, case fatality, uh, next slide please. Um, if you look at some of the um, regional uh, comparisons, when we were looking at Euro um, in the European region, we had case fatality rates of up to eight, above 8% 8 uh, on average, where um, in, in the PAHO region, including America and, and North America, but also younger populations in South America, you have something like 5%. But if you look at, for instance, just uh, in Africa and EMRO, um, you have uh, rates of 2.4 and 2.3% in terms of case fatality rates. So lots of reasons for that. Partially could be reporting issues, but and um, how deaths are being captured and, re and recorded, uh, but also clearly much younger populations. So we'll have to see how this, uh, how this evolves. Next slide, please. So um, just uh, in terms of providing a, a you know, recap of um, our feeling on health systems. These are there's been an increased demand and a really a disruption of services. And all health systems now uh, still 
and for an extended period, even if the burden has gone down slightly, we'll be balancing the demands of, of responding and treating COVID patients and never being sure if the next patient that comes through with a fever, cough, maybe diarrhea, and other symptoms is a COVID patient and a, and a real risk to you and the rest of the uh, patient populations in your hospital or is um, uh, having any one of a number of other diseases. And that's the whole point of some of the guidance that we came out with. If people don't show up um, based on the WHO's organogram or based on uh, sort of our, our conceived notions of we're in the middle of an epidemic. So these people must be COVID, these people must not be. So this uh, means that, that having guidance on how to handle that is really important. So next slide. Um, we have had, when we first came out, just a, a few updates since we last talked, We've come out with an updated operational guidance, um, detailed guidance that all of our regional directors asked us to uh, produce. And just to remind people, WHO has uh, six regional offices with elected regional directors who are very senior and important people um, and respond to member states. And when we came out with our original guidance saying, here are some programmatic things that countries need to do to keep health services open during the crisis, uh, they said, this is great but I need you to go back and give a detailed guidance for different populations and for different diseases. And so we've done that and I'll, I'll show you uh, quickly um, some of the results of that. But we also have um, advice on the use of masks. That was uh, uh, a lot of work, a lot of work uh, looking at uh, mask and mask use um, and happy to answer questions on that. Um, also looking at, uh, we're working right now on mitigating the impact of COVID in long-term care facilities. That's work based on some work done by our European office and also uh, ongoing work on assessing the continuity of essential health services with some of the initial data that we have showing that up to 50% of health services on average across the countries who are reporting have been disrupted. Next slide. So these are the three guidances that have come out. Um, the first one uh, was the programmatic high level. The third one that just came out on the 1st of June um, supersedes it, so it's a more detailed version. So we've taken that first one off the website. Um, so if you have it, you can got, keep it as a limited collector's edition. Be happy to sign it next time I'm in the, uh, at the foundation's uh, gathering. Um, but then we also have a community-based um, uh, community and outreach, community-based treatment, sorry, and outreach services guidance that we've talked about here before for when uh, health workers, social workers have to leave the health facility and head out into the community to deliver services. How do you plan for that? How do you do it safely? Next slide. The, just to give you an idea, I really won't go through it because it's a, it was such a massive piece of work across almost 20 or over 20, um, uh, well over 20 departments uh, and you know something on the order of 250 uh, collaborators uh, that the team worked with, but it, um, it goes through first the more detail on programmatic considerations and systems level considerations for ensuring health services keep operating. And then what are the specific adaptations uh, that, that um, each uh, area needs to consider in order to deliver services. So uh, next slide. So you can see this is the first part that goes through the operational strategies for maintaining services. And this gets into detail around actually selecting those priority services and, and governing those. That, those are not easy questions to be uh, made. Which services are you gonna put on hold? Which will you keep going with? And there's a lot of good examples out there already. Um, how do you manage patient flow at all levels? Um, how do you surge and move around workforce? This is an important consideration, particularly in the US and other places that are facing a struggle with um, fall off and demand for other services, keeping the workforce busy and keeping them um, optimally utilized. Um, then you have issues on central medicines and, and how you manage uh, communication and information. But we also have a discussion around removing barriers, financial barriers to access. WHO has a position that during, uh, um, in general, that uh, we have to minimize, that's the whole goal of this, of the sustainable, uh, the UHC sustainable development goal is to minimize financial barriers to access, minimize the number of families driven into poverty because of healthcare. And so during the pandemic, removing those point of care, uh, user fees and other financial barriers is really priority. Um, and then we have some uh, issues on digital platforms and we can talk about that later. I know there's been some questions that have come up about how to, how to maximize digital platforms and other tools for delivering essential health services. That was in our very first um, webinar that we did together. We talked about some of the examples from that. Uh, next slide, please. So in the second part, we go through 
very detailed considerations across the life course, which is how WHO sees these different population groups uh, across the life course needs um, and how you need to adjust for care for those types of populations. And then looks at um, nutrition, NCDs, and mental health, and what are the considerations there and adjustments that are made. And then communicable diseases across the main communicable diseases areas that we have. And each section has a table that says, what are the, what's the activity um, that's being undertaken? What are the specific adjustments? And then the third column is, what are the sort of medium term kind of recovery or getting back to normal considerations you should start to make um, uh, as you deliver services? So um, this is your roadmap that you should, uh, the, everywhere, we're promoting this across all of our countries right now. There's definitely parts of uh, Europe and North America that could use this. Next slide. So it, we do have, um, it's, uh, if you can click ahead, yeah, thanks. That um, there's a detailed list of indicators. And so when, we sh when you share these, you can actually read them because they're very small. Uh, but it, it, this gives you some idea of the types of things that, that um, we're asking countries to measure as they're looking at whether they are effectively keeping um, essential services running uh, on, on schedule. And um, WHO is collecting some of this information. We can provide comparisons um, for those who would like to, uh, to talk with us about more of that data. So um, next slide. I'll just uh, finish with um, a couple of key points on, on data. This week, we're really focused on data um, at WHO because some of the, as I mentioned, uh, about 60 countries have sent us back information um, looking at, uh, at the you know how they are ensuring essential services we've collected information on on their plans you know do they have the plan does it talk about essential services is there funding behind it um, then what are the what are the services that are disrupted and the main causes and how are they approaching uh, efforts that you know what are their efforts to overcome some of these disruptions what tools and techniques are they using and then um, what uh, priorities do they have for technical assistance from WHO and from uh, other partners on this. And um, anyway, maybe next time we're just pulling it together right now. I, I had vague thoughts that I would slip a couple slides in, but you know, uh, as a current and former data person, you really don't like to show data until it's like completely cooked and everything's been firmly set. So also we're hoping to get a few more countries in because it's a little bit biased right now towards Afro, Emro. We haven't gotten the Euro data in. So um, next time I come, we'll be able to summarize that. Next slide. So just to mention, um, uh, without getting into all the detail, um, I have managed the IPC team for uh, now a big uh, chunk of time since 2007, but I do not count myself as an IPC expert. And the amount of time that the IPC team has spent on this mass guidance, you cannot imagine. So um, the, honestly, when I took over the, the World Alliance for Patient Safety here, never in a million years would I think there would be so much attention on infection prevention, infection prevention, just in the regular uh, sort of your regular community, regular media, um, that probably within about uh, three minutes of this going up, uh, I was getting we were getting questions from all over the world about this, that, or uh, other aspects of it. So people have been really waiting um, for this. There's been obviously advice from CDC and others, uh, the very good uh, information. Um, there is, uh, you know, there are some key differences, but I'm happy to, maybe I won't go into it now and we can talk about it um, afterwards, but basically, basically some originally WHO still stands by the fact that um, uh, on all the evidence suggests in our experience with, uh, with um, previous coronaviruses um, and with SARS shows that um, mandating masks for healthy populations, i.e. just generally in the community, really I mean, there's not so much harm, except for the fact that people tend to not know how to put on and take off masks, and they tend not to wear them correctly, wear them too long, um, not have them of the correct materials. So that's not great. But on average, they really don't, anyway, help with um, community infection rates. But but um, in this environment, this mask, um, this uh, mask guidance does make the um, distinction that uh, at risk particularly at-risk um, patients, elderly patients, uh, others, people with uh, other conditions. Um, if you have to be in crowded settings where you're not able to really physically distance, a mask uh, may, may be a good idea. So there's other, there's other key points in there, particularly around materials for masks. And we have a bunch of great videos explaining this on our website. So for those of you like me who would rather watch a video than read 10,000 words, um, you can check that out. Next slide. 
Um, so I think that's basically it. That, that was really the key pieces that I wanted to summarize. And I know um, this time to leave a little bit, uh, a little bit more um, space for uh, some discussion. And uh, I know we always have great folks online. So probably you'll get as much information in the chat as you will from, <laughs> from listening to me. But anyway, thank you uh, very much, uh, Donna. I'll hand it back to you. No problem. And we have a couple of questions coming in if you, if you can um, stay for a few more minutes with us. Great. Excellent. Um, the first question um, is related to the, the data that you showed suggesting that, um, that potentially age is a factor um, in death from, from coronavirus. Um, do, you, do you have any data about overall wellness? In other words, if in, in, in the countries where they have a universal health healthcare system where access is not as much of an issue as in other countries, are you noticing any trends? Yeah, that is a very interesting question. I mean, um, um, the bottom line is no, we haven't really looked at that. We've been doing deep dives on, uh, we've had several different methods for doing this. We have the epi team here, who's the epidemiology team for the emergencies program, has been doing deep dives, looking at a number of factors, um, uh, looking at in particular, um, uh, sort of testing strategy and also um, age structures. Uh, we have um, started to look at, and maybe we'll be able to come back the next time, um, you know, if people looked at, it's, I think it's a very interesting report and not just because I ha helped write it, but um, uh, in 2019 for the biannual UHC monitoring report, which is a report we have to produce the WHO leads on but does with the World Bank um, uh, for the SDG 3.8. And this was produced for the high level meeting, the UN high level meeting on universal health coverage, if people remember that um, uh, uh, September 2019, back when we used to be able to get on planes and trains and get together in big groups, um, that uh, it looked, it put out uh, um, numbers on the UHC index, which is a a set of 16 indicators uh, across different service areas, um, and then also looks at financial protection. And uh, it doesn't rate countries, but actually you, you could look at that as, a, as a, a measure of universal health coverage. So we're just starting to look at that and how that compares with, um, with uh, uh, infection rates and death rates. At the moment, there's no really honestly clear pattern at the moment, but you, because um, particularly for death rates, the folks that are quite weak, you have four types of countries that, that on UHC, ones that are uh, spend a lot of money, but, but have decent coverage, ones that um, have de very good coverage, but get much more value out of it, don't spend so much money. And then those that aren't able to spend very much uh, and are still able to get decent uh, coverage, and then ones that are really having trouble. And obviously the ones in that last one, the quadrant four, are your weak countries, your Yemen's, where the health system's really collapsed. If people have been following Yemen, there was a pledging conference for, um, for Yemen just recently this week. It was very, and we didn't quite get as much as we were hoping. They're really, really struggling, very high rates of infections. It's a little bit different than some of the other countries we've seen. Um, so, uh, but death rates have tended to be low in those countries because um, one, there's a lot of background, other background mortality that may be a classification issue. And then there's also that the young, there's a young population. So there's a lot of other factors going in there. But um, anyway, hope to come back next time and have a little bit more information on that. That's great, thanks. Um, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about MISC. This is the, the new inflammatory uh, presentation that we're seeing in children. Do you know much about that in terms of presentation and treatment? Yeah, you know, we have recently um, put out and I'm happy to share, uh, um, you know, in, uh, at some point um, after the uh, after the webinar, the a recent uh, brief on this, um, where we had and we've got new uh, case report form that we're looking at um, in terms of uh, this particular um, multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome. Um, we've got some information that we've um, put together uh, that could be useful uh, on this, but um, in terms of the uh, the work that WHO has done. Um, it's uh, been recent, um, you know, it's one of these things that the overall message, I guess, is that it is really quite rare. Um, and the vast, vast majority of um, 
country of um, how should I put it of uh, cases uh, don't occur in these in these patients. Um, there's definitely more information that's needed uh, to be studied on this, and I think that there's um, you know clearly uh, the a mandate for examining this and collecting more information. But right now, WHO just really doesn't have so much uh, information that it's gathered on on the topic. And we can send some of this uh, information, you know, once we uh, come to the end of the session here, I can give you a send the, the link for the recent uh, brief that we've had um, and, you know, what country is doing on this. Uh, UNICEF has also published um, some information on this as well. And I think it's, um, it's clearly something we should watch, but uh, the bottom line is it's a very, very rare condition uh, and the exact sort of progression um, from a mild uh, infection to this is really not uh, as of yet uh, understood so well. So I think we really have to gather more uh, data on it. Yeah. Well, it looks like Zandil is on the ball. She's got uh, links already in the chat box for that. So, so thank you to Zandil. Um, yeah. In terms of the like the the information that's there, you know, the like the number that we have now. Um, that we are looking at, a you know, number of them ha also have some underlying uh, conditions. And I think that that's one of the things that uh, we're looking at. Um, you know, the, the, the features are similar um, to what, anyway, people probably heard of Kawasaki disease and, uh, and also toxic uh, shock syndrome. But um, the, the fact that it, it could be related to COVID is at this point, even not sort of definitely sure that it's uh, related to, to COVID. So, and usually these kids are treated with anti-inflammatory treatment, um, steroids, uh, other, other treatments like that. But I think, um, we, you know, understanding exactly what this is uh, will, be, will be really important. We do have on the website a case definition um, that uh, is, uh, anyway, it's basically in line with CDC's case definition as well. And CDC has some good information on its uh, website uh, also. So once we have more data um, uh, on the clinical from the clinical platform that we're collecting information on, we definitely would like to come back to you. And for those of you who are, you know, providers or hospital managers who would like to participate in that clinical platform, not just for this reason, but for a, a whole host of reasons in terms of staying on top of some of the stuff WHO's chose tra um, um, uh, tracking, we can definitely provide you with that information. Great. Um, another question is related to um, some of the guidance strategies that you shared before that, um, you know, in some cases are, are regional. Do you have any recommendations for folks about how they can prioritize these on a local level? How they can prioritize? The, the, some of the global, the, the guidance oh. strategies that you had discussed. Yeah, um, I th think that on uh, basically some of the, um, the strategies the WHO has come out with in general um, have the the sort of their applicability is only is um, is sort of malleable based on the structure of the health system and how decisions are made. So in some countries, decisions on um, public health considerations and some of the public health measures are made at a national level. Some of them are made at a state or province or region level, and some are even made at local levels. Um, and so similarly, uh, the guidance that we've come out with on essential health services, you know, we've tried to provide that, um, the, that's why we have this sort of part one, which is the kind of systems level or um, uh, high, programmatic management considerations that are there. But all of those uh, sort of detailed adjustments are really about what you do at a health facility, at a hospital, um, what you do when you're a campaign team heading out to do immunizations or to go out to visiting on social service work or, or other outreach work. So uh, the majority of the essential health services work that we have produced has really been about local decision making. Um, now, the, I think that this is one of those questions that country context really makes a big difference. Your own context makes a big difference. So. Um, you know, how you operationalize those uh, are some of the lessons that, that we're trying to collect. We have a new learning platform that we're getting, uh, gathering information on and, and it would be great to uh, connect with the foundation and see how we could gather some of the lessons learned from how people are making their own adjustments and um, sort of best practices. 
uh, whether it be in long-term care, hospital care, or primary health care in particular, that would be really useful. Great. We do have a question about long-term care, but I know that you mentioned that you, um, you have some information coming out about that. So um, we actually have several questions and only about five minutes left. So if it's okay, I'm just going to pick just a few of these and then perhaps we can have, uh, we can um, send these questions to you over email and then we can share them with our network later. Great. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, question for you about um, the, uh, the, the increase in cases that we're seeing, uh, especially here in the United States, you know, you've seen um, a lack of social distancing um, most recently, um, you know, with, with both with, uh, with economies opening up and with some of the protests. So um, do you think that, um, that there is a, what do you see is gonna happen um, in the next few weeks? What are you guys thinking um, may happen with the peaks? Yeah, I, um... You know, I've been asked this by many people um, from like my church council, where we um, anyway, I'm on the, my church council. I hope that makes you think better of me. Um, and that uh, up to, you know, sort of some of our national counterparts. And the bottom line is like, honestly, WHO has good ideas about it, but really no one knows exactly what's gonna happen. But um, the at one level, like I've said before, most countries, um, even uh, now in Switzerland, it's probably only 7% of the population has been exposed. Most countries are no more than 10%. So that means that um, really from uh, most communities, they are not that much different in terms of being magically immune to this virus than they were before the sort of rise in cases uh, started. So most people are still vul vulnerable. Um, we seem to have, how shall I put it, uh, kind of come to the point where um, corresponding to the very understandable move away from the, uh, the closing of businesses and schools and other things like that, the quote unquote lockdown, that countries for lots of very good reasons have to restart. Um, so what needs to happen though is for a period of time until the until the vaccine is available to us. And I think that's something that's really important. We will have to be maintaining good testing and robust testing uh, approaches and good contact tracing. Those will be our two key tools um, in managing this. And then the third tool will be uh, the public health measures and really trying to maintain and make hand hygiene stations available as much as possible. Um, managing the numbers for any given interior space, um, wh whether it be work or school or other places. And then, um, uh, and then really depending on uh, the communities to understand that, that things haven't magically ended, that they still need to be responsible, even if they're able to have a bit more freedom. So um, I think the, the recent um, big, big gatherings, and it's not just the U.S. actually, there was huge protests in, the, in France over some there have been some recent uh, threatened closures of because of the difficulties with uh, the economy on um, different factories, et cetera, big community gatherings and not respecting physical distancing. And um, so those are basically the definition of super spreader events. So um, I think we'll have to keep an eye on this, but a, a number of countries um, have had big spikes bigger spikes even than the first. So for instance, like Iran, um, and then there are countries that have uh, just continued upwards, which includes uh, Philippi Philippines is another country with a bigger second wave, um, India, Bangladesh, um, but France and Switzerland have also seen some increases. So we will likely see the, a wave like this as we go along and there'll have to be um, some adjustments uh, as we go. So uh, I think this is something that we're obviously in this for the, the medium term and there there needs to be a um, an approach that manages the uh, the uh, opening up but also does it responsibly and then one more question that's a little bit related to that um, as you probably know there was some confusion yesterday when um, when the World Health Organization was indicating that there isn't that much of a spread from asymptomatic carriers as we had originally thought um, I think I, I believe that she clarified her comments. I wonder if you could um, help to clarify that a little bit more about um, the, the transmission from asymptomatic carriers. Yeah, 
you know, we've talked about that with the mass guidance and people should check that out. It's a little bit more detailed in there, but um, it's uh, it def definitely something we're tracking. Um, the, all the evidence still suggests that it's quite, that it's still relatively difficult to get uh, that people do shed the virus, but don't, sh but it's relatively difficult to get it, um, to be infected by an asymptomatic uh, carrier just because the sort of um, the ways, the coughing and other ways that they would leave traces of the virus or, or expel traces of the virus um, are much more limited. It's not on, definitely not unheard of particularly, and mo you know, a lot of the asymptomatic has been within families. So they're sort of, you know, they're, they're obviously in shared space much more frequently. So, um, but it's relatively difficult still uh, from what the evidence suggests for an asymptomatic person to casually uh, infect a casual contact rather than a close contact. I appreciate the clarification. I know that there, that it's been all over Twitter, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot, um, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Ed. I always appreciate you joining us. We're looking forward to having you back in, in a couple of weeks. And, and in the meantime, we'll send you the questions that we weren't able to get to today. And um, we can send those out to our network separately. That sounds good, Donna. I know there were some questions that people had about elderly parents and or relatives and would be happy to talk about that. I think it's a big challenge. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that our long-term care guidance is gonna help for some of those congregate facilities, but also managing you know, long-term care and home care does obviously doesn't happen just in facilities. So you have to, bottom line is um, figuring out ways of, of managing the exposure and, and potential, you know, minimizing infection. Basically, everything is doable, and especially things have to be doable to, um, in order to keep people's sort of mental state and spirits and their uh, livelihoods going, but, but it has to be thought through and done deliberately and done every single time. That's the bottom line with infection prevention. But anyway, we're happy to take those questions offline. We can write up some, some work and put uh, anyone in contact with some of our experts. That's fabulous. Well, thank you again so much, and uh, we'll see you in a few weeks, I hope. Sounds good. All right. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.